We recognize our praises and adoration must be very feeble compared with that of the angels. All those beings who cease not to say by day or night, holy, holy, holy. More and more we need to see you in your majesty, in your holiness, in your beauty. <coughs> we think of the millions who have gone to shrines today, to strange gods, even in carvings are hurried and formidable. They've gone with sincerity, they've gone with desires to find answers that they never find. But we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. And we call you our Father because he called you Father. <coughs> and because he is the Son of God, we are permitted to be the sons of God. And it does not appear yet what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we shall see him as he is. We think of that company that has gone before us. <coughs> no computer in the world can estimate how many millions of Christians have lived and died. Some of them got through the pearly gates bloodstained, disfigured, dismembered, of whom the world was not worthy. We think of a brief life story of Antipas in your world, and all you left was, of the record is Antipas, my faithful martyr. Lord, we think how easy is our lot compared to theirs. We come to this house tonight well nourished, with people who love us and care for us, and above all, we thank you for that love that will not let us go. We recognize, Lord, there was no beauty that you should desire us. We were disfigured and rebellious. But we thank you for the love that drew salvation's plan, for the grace that brought it down to man, and for the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. Then my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. We thank you for all your proclaiming this gospel tonight, even as we pray all over this nation and other nations. We thank you for those who have sweated and toiled in jungles, shot dangerous rapids, lived in an atmosphere that's almost untenable, with food that's almost uneatable, with people strange and fierce, and yet the love of Christ constrains them to go and take this message of redeeming love. We have indeed, as World Song says, we have a story to tell to the nations. We've been very tardy about it. Two thousand years after you died and rose again, Lord Jesus, most of the world, three quarters of it is unevangelized anyhow. <coughs> as we come into your presence tonight, we ask you again, teach us to pray. Yes. Give us a praying spirit, give us a loving spirit, give us a compassionate spirit. Give us a desperate spirit. Yes. We can say truly with the disciples tonight, because of the need we have and the world has, the church has, to whom shall we go? For thou hast the words of eternal life. But we thank you, you are more than adequate for this generation, crooked and perverse, perverted, rebellious, and rotten it may be. But we remember Hebrews 7.25 says, He is able to save to the uttermost. And we bless you for those who are declaring that glorious message tonight. We pray again as we turn to your word, as we sang earlier, beyond the sacred page we seek thee, Lord. We're not seeking a theology to fight somebody else's theology. We want to know thee in thy living power and splendor and glory. Whom to know is life eternal. This is a blessed, blessed privilege. We thank you for that happy day that fixed our choice. We've seen all the master we want. There's no other Lord we want to serve. As your word says, other lords have had dominion over us. We won't even mention their names. They would even pollute this atmosphere tonight. But they had dominion over us, over our hearts, over our affections, over our intentions, over our purposes. But we thank you for the day when you snap those fetters. As we sang in that hymn again, Then shall all bondage cease. There's not one of us can make a legitimate claim to bondage tonight, not that we want to. But there are some who have no message of deliverance of the heart. 
We pray, Lord, that your word may live and move in us more and more and more each day. Get glory out of this service, we ask in Jesus' name. Thank you. Be seated. We come to look into the uh, <coughs> gospel as recorded by Luke. And the, well, the third chapter. I suppose most of us can quote John 3.16 without looking at it. How many of us can quote Luke 3.16 without looking at it? It's the other side of the coin. It should be as well known. Well, here it is in the good King James Version. John 3, verse 16. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, a latchet to whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and in this version, Holy Ghost and with fire, but the original says Holy Ghost fire, because God is a consuming fire. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of fire. And Jesus said, I'm come to bring fire on earth. There's no escaping fire. It's a kind of a cliche of mine, but I still get a lift out of saying it. I believe that tonight the world is going to hellfire because the church has lost Holy Ghost fire. It's as simple as that. Again, there's an awesome gap between Malachi and Matthew. It's a period of 400 years of darkness without any prophetic light. And then like Halley's Comet, it was mentioned Halley's Comet, or Halley's Comet, which is supposed to be around. Somebody saw it the other day, 300, I don't know, was it 300,000 miles above the Earth? Somebody has good eyesight. It's streaking across the sky even now. John Baptist came streaking across a sky that was totally black, but he was, he was incandescent. The Word says he was a burning and a shining light. Jesus, the greatest character reader in history, says there was no man comparable to John Baptist, not Isaiah, not Jeremiah, not any of those towering saints. He's a very, very remarkable character. Again, between Malachi and Matthew, you have 400 years of blackness without any prophetic light, 400 years of stillness without any prophetic voice, and then suddenly, dramatically, unexpectedly, this strange man appears in the wilderness. It was not only a wilderness geographically, it was a wilderness morally, it was a wilderness politically, it was a wilderness uh, religiously. You see, you go back here and you read in the scripture about Ezra and Nehemiah, but actually they'd left a legacy. Between Ezra and, Ezra and Nehemiah, they established a governorship over Israel made of 120 priests and rulers. 120, does that strike a bell? No? You don't have bells, all right. 120 they established to rule over Israel. What about the other 120 that came up? Untrained, unlettered, unusual men, who without financial black backing or organization turned the world upside down. I said this, this was a jungle theologically. These priests and elders ruled over Israel for 150 years, not living that time, but with an interchange of priests and Levites and rulers. For 120 years, 150 years, they dominated that nation. In 170, 170 BC, there was a man with the strange name of Antiochus Epiphanes. You need to look up his name and his relatives. He took Jerusalem over, he polluted the temple, he made the Jews sacrifice to idols. <coughs> he sacrificed, uh, pardon me, he built a statue of Jupiter where the burnt offering should have been on uh, the altar of the burnt offering. 
Jupiter, remember, was the name of the Roman god. They changed it to Jove, an imitation of Jehovah. He did everything he could do to obliterate the uh, message of the Old Testament. For instance, he cut the throat of a swine on the, ch on the high altar to, con to bring condemnation, he thought. He burned the scriptures publicly. And all this horrendous stuff went on. He prohibited the worship of Jehovah. Who was it? In, in 37 BC, Herod the Great came. He betrayed the nation to the Romans. He fostered immorality. He massacred the noble people. He built that magnificent temple that was standing. Now with this horrendous background of murder and rape and debauchery and suffering and agony, John Baptist steps on the stage. Again, a remarkable character. You see, today we try to organize. We try to get a bunch of people together. God never did that. God takes single men. They may be married, but they're single men. Oh. I should say better, individual men. Oh. He takes Moses to the backside of the desert. John the Baptist, the word here tells me that he was in the, in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. Thirty years in the wilderness. Jesus was thirty years. The Son of God, who had left the glory for 30 years in training to minister. John Baptist, 30 years in training. The Apostle Paul, at least 30 years. Moses, at least 40 years. And we want to go to Bible school for six months and come out like a super prophet. It's the time factor that kills most of us. Tell me how much time you spend alone with God, and I'll tell you how spiritual you are. Not how many meetings you go to, not how many gifts you have. Not how many sermons you've preached, not how many records you've made. Tell me what time you spend alone with God. And I'll tell you how spiritual you are. The word here tells me about this remarkable man that John Baptist was in the wilderness <coughs> until a day of his showing, for showing forth. Going forth at the command of God, of course, himself. He's a remarkable man, Jesus said. I should think he is. Let me tell you what it says about him. It says in this, uh, which chapter? The first chapter of Luke. And verse 41, it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe, babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. When? When she met Jesus. Where was Jesus? In the womb of his mother. Immediately she came into the presence of Jesus Christ, she was filled with the Holy Ghost. It says in verse 67, his father was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. It says a bit further on, in verse 25 of chapter 2, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem, and his name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So this remarkable man, no wonder Jesus says he's a superman. His mother was filled with the Holy Ghost, his father was filled with the Holy Ghost, and his preacher was filled with the Holy Ghost. You young people get married, that's all right. You know what they say, marriage, uh, love is blind, marriage is an eye-opener. <coughs> but apart from that, you say we're considering having a family, we go get examined. The doctor checks us up and says, yes, we're in prime health, this is the time to have a child. What about it? You go to God and ask him if you're in condition to have one? Very often a child takes on the nature of its parents at the time of, of conception. John Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. His father was filled with the Holy Ghost. His preacher was filled with the Holy Ghost. No wonder he was remarkable. But then he was in the wilderness of all places. 
until the day of his showing forth. It says he had his dwelling amongst wild beasts, ferocious things. The remarkable thing to me as I read this again today is this, he had no role model. Elijah's, Elijah says, make me God, make me like Elijah, but give me a double portion of his spirit. Joshua had Moses as a role model. Paul, uh, Timothy had Paul as a supermodel in front of him. And right through the scripture you find these men that have lived with some giant and they become like him. But this man has no model before him. What did he do wandering on the rocks? He ate wild honey, it says. And he was with wild beasts and he was a wild man. It gives you a kind of a rundown on the awesomeness of this man's ministry. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. Look in chapter 3. This first verse is kind of amusing to me. I really don't know why it's here. Luke 3, 1. The fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being the Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip the Tetrarch of Arturia, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias the Tetrarch of Abilene. That, that's about as refreshing as a mouthful of sand, isn't it? <laughs> what in the world do you do with it? Except it gives you a framework. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, that's illegal. They could only have one high priest and they got two. Then came John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. He came unto all the country round about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Boy, that's a dirty thing to preach these days. Who preaches repentance? There's an old hymn that says, Repentance is to leave the sins I've done before and show that I in earnest grieve by doing them no more. Sin is more than saying I'm sorry. Repentance is mental, it's something in my mind. I'm going this way and I turn that way. When I'm going this way, I say God's in the wrong and I'm in the right. When I turn around, I say God is in the right. If he's saying that the hell is in the right. I repent of that. It's not just repenting for the sin I've done, it's repenting about the motive that made me do the sin. It's going out past the fruit to the root. Yes. Because if the root of corruption is there, there's going to be root, uh, fruit coming out that's wrong. Doesn't it say in, well, I didn't check it, I think it's in Romans 7, it talks about having your fruit unto holiness, and it's talking there about regenerate people, not people who claim to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And John goes out, stands and ministers there. And they come to him, he's a success anyway you count it. Geographically, they come from the north and south and east and west. He's a success, if you like, socially. Here's a big difference, let me uh, emphasize it here. In this third chapter, <laughs> let me see it. I miss a good point here. Verse 6. All flesh shall see the salvation of God, and they did it in his day. Then he said to the multitude that came to be baptized him, You generation of vipers. Isn't that pleasant? No. Do you know anybody that there stand up in the first Baptist or the last Baptist church tomorrow morning and say, You generation of vipers? I'm sick of talking to you. Huh? They'd sure take a love offering for him, wouldn't they? To get him out of town. Oh, generation of vipers, who warned you to flee? Bring, uh, warned you to flee from the wrath to come. He was not only condemning their sin there, he says there's a, there's a gate there, and when he gets through it, it's eternal wrath from God. We've forgotten about the wrath of God. I don't know if I told you last week, whether I did or not, I'll tell you this week. My neighbour, is preaching, uh, he usually sits there, but... Uh, Jacob is preaching in England tonight. A friend of his told him he'd seen the bumper sticker, and don't it said on it? Jesus is coming and he's as mad as hell. Sacrilege? No, scripture. Second Thessalonians 1 says he's coming in flaming fire in judgment on this world. In other words, he's as mad as hell. It may be a bad way of putting it, but it's a truth. You see, we're all looking for gentle Jesus, meek and mild. 
The attitude of the average Christian today is relax and be raptured. But he's coming with flaming vengeance on this world. There's a time when his spirit runs out. Here is a man filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the fire of the Spirit of God. I was looking up there, let me look back here a minute. In Exodus 33, <clears throat> you know, if you take care some other time, not now, you'll find fire in the third chapter of Genesis. When those wicked people sinned in the Garden of Eden, what was put there? A cherubim. You know, seraphim is only mentioned once in the scripture, that's in Isaiah 6. The cherubim are always on the defense, and God put cherubim there at the Garden of Eden so they couldn't get back. He barred the way with fire. In the third of Genesis, in the third of Exodus, you'll find fire. Now, I, I confess to you, I get angry about this thing. You see, the symbol of the Church of Jesus Christ is not a cross, that's pagan. You can wear it on, on your chest, it's easier to wear a cross than bear a cross anyhow. Right. Stick it over a church, stick it on your tombstone. It is not Christian, it's pagan, it's cruel. It was the most hideous form of death known in the world, and they put the holiest man that ever lived on a cross and mangled his body there. And God watched his son being mangled and did nothing about it. He'd watch men put to death today in Russia and elsewhere, and he does nothing about it. There's going to be a day of the vengeance of God, and when God gets angry, you've no idea what it is. It's like a thousand volcanoes exploding. He has appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world, and the poor blind world doesn't know much about it, and the poor blind church doesn't think much about it now. Okay, let me look at this in Exodus 32. <coughs> Imagine this, people have been delivered again and again and again. God had done miracles for them. I ask you in God's name, what did miracles do for them? Did it strengthen their faith? No, they didn't believe God. God sent them angels food every day. God allowed a man to split a rock and the water followed them where they went. Did he do anything for them? Their shoes didn't wear out in 40 years. Their clothes didn't wear out 40 years. They didn't get sweaty either. And yet, though they ate miracle and drank miracle and saw miracle and preached miracle, it didn't do a thing for them. They were still unbelieving. God gave America its day of miracles. When I first came to America in 1950, all kinds of folk, A.A. A. Allen was there with a 10,000 seat pack, seated tent packing it out. Oral Roberts was on the ro ro road. Miss Coleman was on the road. A.A. A. Allen, Jack Cole was on the road. There were dozens of men with eight, five, seven, eight, nine, and ten thousand seat tents. God gave us miracles. Did it, did it redeem us? Did it change us? It became a form of Christian entertainment. Well, look at this for a minute here, please. In Exodus 32, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mount, and the people gathered themselves unto Aaron and said to him, Up! Make us gods which shall go before us. For this Moses, that man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is come of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off your earrings which are on your ears, and so forth. Verse 3, And all the people break off their earrings which are in their ears. Verse 4, He received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graven tool. And after that he made a molten calf and said, These be thy gods of Israel. And they rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink. Go over to chapter 33. And verse 2. I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, and take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. <coughs> verse 5. For the Lord said unto Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment, and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. The children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments at Mount Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. Get the point? He took the holy place out of the midst of that crooked and perverse company. Tell me, why didn't God Almighty give them a system of worship? Why didn't he give them a tabernacle? Why didn't he give them priests? Why didn't he give them sacrifices? Why they were in Egypt? They were living in slavery. They were living in hell. 
And God let them stay there. Because, you see, there's a time in, in, in God's calendar, and he doesn't reveal it to us always. But what happened here? Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle, for all the people rose up and stood every man at the door and looked at Moses, he was gone. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended. It was a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. I said to someone this week, if you were in London going past uh, where the Queen lives, where she lives now? Oh, she lives in Buckingham Palace. And somebody says, the Queen's at home. How do you know? Because that huge flag up there has a Union Jack on it. When it's at home, the flag is flying. When she's not at home, it's not there. I believe the sign of God's presence in a sanctuary is the pillar of fire. Yeah. Well, then this person said, well, I've heard it said, it's a pillar of joy. Well, doesn't it say in his presence there's fullness of joy? That's not eternity. The reason our kids need so much entertainment in churches, there's no joy of the Lord there. It's more than clapping our hands on your feet and feeling sweet and sugary on the inside. It's the living vibration of an eternal God who stands in the midst and there's something you can't explain. God is beyond definition. I can't explain him. I can't experience him. I know when he touches me when I'm alone in the night, in the middle of the night, two or three o'clock in the morning. I know when his living presence comes into my office in a special, special way of anointing. But notice he did not come until they went outside the camp. Yeah. There are very, very few occasions when God Almighty has revived dead denominations. He did it in the Welsh revival for sure. But the men who stir their generation have to go outside the camp. Doesn't it say in Hebrews 13, 13 that he went outside the camp? That's fine. But when it comes to the second half of us, you go outside the camp and bear his reproach. Maybe before long God will bring a cleavage somewhere in this city, in this great town of Tyler. I hope he does. And you'll have to get out of sight the camp. You'll have to leave your group and go join the people who have the anointing of God. They may be penniless and poor and have no stained glass windows and no beautiful choir. I detest going to churches where all oh, the old come filing in in white shirts. And I wonder if it's the Ku Klux Klan coming in. I'm impressed with this. You not, may not be, but I am. Do, do, do. Verse 9, it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, a pillar, a cloudy pillar, descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and all the people saw the pillar. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Your little boy wakes up at night and says, Mummy, uh... Sometimes I think of those days we were in Egypt. I think of that terrible journey we made and I wonder what's going to happen. And he said, darling, and puts her arms around him and says, you see that? That pillar of fire over there? That's the holy place. Our holy, <coughs> our holy God brands it with his presence of fire. Doesn't it say in Hebrews that God makes his angels ministering spirits and his ministers flames of fire? We've got snowmen in the pulpit with icicles hanging all around. If ever the fire comes, there'll be some melting. I say again, this man, J.B. has no pattern before him. I'll tell you what he does have. I'm sure his mother and father were the most godly people on earth, filled with the Holy Ghost. Do you think they told him funny stories? They did what the godliest people on earth outside of Christianity do, the Jews, still instilling to their children who their prophets were, who Moses were, who Elijah were. But they have the greatest men in history. I believe this man walked up and down amongst the wild beasts and there he is. He doesn't eat much. <laughs> Some big flies, you know, a bit bigger than these horrible uh, things that eat my garden, uh, grasshoppers. Big, big things, he caught them like that and put them on a rock and roasted them. And three times a day he had locust burgers. <laughs> Nothing else to eat except locusts and wild honey. 
and the people come near to hear him. I'll say it again for my comfort, if not yours. You never have to advertise a fire. Whether it's spiritual or it's a physical fire, you never, there's the most self-advertising thing in the world is a fire. I remember getting home between one and two o'clock in a morning in England. I said to my wife, sweetheart, one of the big mills in town is on fire. Let's go, it's nearly two o'clock, there'll be nobody there. Everybody in the city woke up with the same idea, so they all went. We couldn't get within three blocks of the place. I said, sweetheart, we'll go round it. We went round in our little car, you know, those tiny little things. When we got halfway down the street, it was so fierce we couldn't even stand there. The fire was so horrible in its majesty, this huge mill burning. I wonder how many of us have really seen a man who was on fire for God. I reminded you the other week again that when the Holy Ghost came in the upper room, how did he come? Did he come as a dove? When Jesus received his baptism, the Spirit came as a dove upon him. There was nothing in him to purify. He comes to us in fire because we need purification. I remember a night in Gillingham, which is maybe, uh, I don't know, 60, 70 miles east of London. We rented a church. I'll tell you who came. If you've read The Smuggler, God Smuggler, you know, he talks in there about a, a man called Uncle Hoppy. Well, Uncle Hoppy hopped in the meeting that day. He came in the most broken down automobile I've ever seen. He was nuts. Pardon the phrase, but he was sanctified nuts. He came in clothes that were almost worn out. He bought all his clothes at the Salvation Army. The only thing he wouldn't wear second hand was a hat. He was afraid of getting some germs or something in his hair. This old car came wheezing up the street. Rheumatism in all the, in all the wheels and asthma in the motor. It was sobbing and groaning as it came up the hill. He stayed with us for a half night of prayer. One day a missionary came to see him. It was Friday and he said, well, do you have a need? He said, yes, I need 10,000 pounds, which is about, at that time, $50,000. Oh, I've got that in my safe. Here it is. Take it with you. Because he had two or three hundred men working for him, he gave all their wages away. Next morning, they came for wages. He said, I have no money. They said, we have to pay rent and buy food. And Oh, he said, I'll pay it Monday morning, and the money came. He did that two or three times. He was wild. But I liked him. I was so tired of seeing sick, tame preachers in England, you know, they wear their collars backwards way right? because they're going backwards way. Right? <coughs> you know, I used to wear my collar like that, you wouldn't believe it. But once I started going forward, I took it off and went forward, you see. I never forget that night of prayer. There were surges of blessing. There were times when God so came in power, I was afraid to open my eyes. We started praying at nine o'clock. Between one and two in the morning, we were going out. There was an old lady sitting in a chair at the back, a wheelchair, a white-haired lady. Oh, brother, she said, she didn't know any of our names. Wasn't it wonderful? I said, it was. One of the best prayer meetings, I've been in many prayer meetings. That was one of the greatest, most powerful. Wasn't it wonderful? I said, sure, I said that. Did you feel anything different about one o'clock? I said, yes, I felt a hand or something came. I felt a quickening in my, it was just then. Just then what? You didn't see it? No, no. I was my head down praying. She said, a tongue of fire came on the head of the first man, went to the next, went to the next, went to the next, went to the next, right to the end. It was awesome. No wonder every one of us felt a mighty insurge of the life of God. Or the power of God, define it as you will. You see, there's a great deal of difference between revival and evangelism. I'm so sick today, I hardly read any reports that come to me of meetings. Everybody's getting half of America saved. If you save all the lists of people saved, everybody in America has been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost about six times over in the last ten years. The whole population. And yet we're as dumb and dead and as damned as we were when we started off. Will you come? Oh, we'll sing for you, dear. You just, there's nobody in the world but you. There's room at the cross for you. 
So they come with tears, jerking, and forget all about God and everything in 10 minutes after. You want to know what preaching is? Study this third chapter in the Gospel of Luke. And when you've read that, read the 26th chapter of, of the Acts of the Apostles, where Paul is standing before a heathen king in a pagan court. And he says, God called me to preach. This is preaching. He summarizes it. It's to open the eyes of the blind, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them that are sanctified. People come to the altar, meet them at the door, ask what happened. Oh, uh, 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 I confess my sin. There's not one evangelist in 50 in America today preaching salvation. They're preaching forgiveness. Just come and get forgiven. That's not salvation. Jesus came to do more than forgive us our sins. He came more for something more to rescue us from hell. He came to rescue us from sin and from sinning. Not just our past sins, but to stop this damnable business that makes God so sad. He that is born of God doth not, and it's a big letter, N-O-T, not commit sin. You say it's impossible to sin. No, it's possible for it not to sin. They're making a fuss about getting the Titanic up now, aren't they? It was built in Ireland. Sailed in 1912. 1,500 people perished on it. Well, I've been on the greatest liners in the world across the Atlantic nearly 20 times. And in some terrible storms. The first time I looked at the Queen Mary, that, I mean, don't mean the lady, I mean the ship. There's the deck 80 feet up there, and I thought, this thing will never move. When it got to mid-Atlantic, the, the sea showed how powerful it was. It tossed it around like a rowing boat. 82,000 tons tossed around like that. I knew it was possible for that ship to sink. Not impossible. I knew it was possible for it not to sink. It crossed the Atlantic more than 500 times. You know, when people say, well, my pastor says you have to sin every day in thought, word, and deed, I say, ask him to give him a list of your sins you can commit. Give you a list of the sins you can commit, a list of the sins you can't commit. What can you commit? Sins of the flesh, but not of the spirit? Sins of the spirit, but not in your thought life? You see, this is the only religion in the world that gives a man deliverance from sin. John the Baptist priest, right, let me go back a minute there. The tongue of fire. What happened? Peach, Peach, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. What does it say? They were pricked in their hearts. After that, Stephen preached. We've had him two Friday nights, and I don't know if you got blessed. I didn't in the meditation. And when he preached, the same thing happened. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, says to the man that he ran away from, you crucified the Lord of glory. You killed him. Stephen says, you murdered the Son of God. And that's preaching. You know, when Nathan went to David, he didn't say, you know, some of you are guilty. Did he? <laughs> he said, thou art the man. Oh, people say, I'd love to go to a Holy Ghost church. Would you? Somebody says, hey, fellow, listen, last night you committed adultery. You embezzled some money this week. You've got a spirit of hatred, which God says is as bad as committing murder. Again, Jesus came not to save us just from sinning, from sins, but from sinning. When they heard these men, they were pricked in their hearts. I go back into the second chapter, pardon me again, in the third chapter. <coughs> verse 7, the middle of verse 7, he says, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruit meat for repentance. And quit saying we have Abraham to our father. Isn't this nice? He called them vipers and now he says God can do as much through stones as through Abraham. Don't boast of Abraham. If God wants, he'll turn those stones into children to worship him. That's pretty uh, much exhausting their theology, isn't it? And now at nine he says the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore bring forth Good fruit is honed down and cast, if it bringeth not forth good fruit, it is cast down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, he didn't ask them. They were so conscious of guilt, they were so, had, felt as though they had some serpent or the tail of a scorpion stinging them. 
They don't look back because of their sins. They don't look forward because of judgment. They don't look round about them. Somebody might come pouncing on them. And so they cried out. This is revival. It's not singing some sentimental chorus, would you like to come? Jesus is waiting, ringing his heavens in heaven. He'll be so upset if you don't come. Jesus doesn't care a hill of beans whether you come or not. He's done everything he can do for you. You have to do the rest. He's not going to whip you into submission. He's not going to demand that you sing love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. It's on your side to do it. But notice who they were. The people asked him, verse 10, what shall we do? Verse 12, then came the publicans to be baptized. And they said, Master, what shall we do? You've got them from the people to the publicans. <coughs> Verse 14, the soldiers. I was going to say, do you know Kipling's Recessional, one of the greatest hymns ever written? God of our fathers, none of all, God of our far flung battle line. Well, he talks about the lesser breeds outside of the law, which the Jews thought everybody was inferior to them. The soldiers came. They were Romans. They'd lived in a pagan society. They'd never seen a man on fire for God. They'd never seen a priest who didn't care a bit about his trimmings. Remember this man was born. His father was Zacharias. His father went into the temple in a snow white garment with a helmet on. And he got there to the altar. There was an angel on the right side. Why the right side? Because he's on the left side, he's going to speak to the nation. He's going to speak to this man. And he says to him, fear not, your wife is going to bring forth a child. And what does he say? Well, you can read when you go home. I can't put my fingers in chapter one anyhow. Uh, the child is, your, your child, your wife's going to bear a child. No, 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 no. She's far too old. She's another Sarah. And God does a miracle to raise that child up. His father's a priest of the course of Abia. There were 12 courses. And his father was a priest of the course of Abia. He did this once in his life only. As we say in England, there's a long queue. You would say there's a line behind him of at least 2,000 priests all waiting for the one time in their lives when they'll go in this long white garment and they'll go into the Holy of Holies, which is awesome. When he gets in there, there's a, a marvelous person by the name of Gabriel. Fear not, I have a message from God for you. If you haven't had it, if you walk with God, one day you'll go to a meeting and you'll think, God Almighty is talking to nobody in that congregation but you. Why is he singling me out? Because you've got ears to hear that you didn't have before. Because you've got a hunger for God you never had before. You've heard me say this, I say it again. In the right way, I'm scared when I get to the judgment seat and there's a billion people looking on me that God will say to me, Son, I had many things to tell you down in Tyler, but you couldn't bear them. You weren't grown up enough. A man leaves his son millions of dollars. He puts a caution in the will and says, you can't spend a dime of this until you're 20 years of age. Then you can buy yourself, if you want, a Lagondo. The new Lagondo is $150,000, if you're thinking of buying me one. You can't buy a Lagondo. You can't buy a jet. You can't build a mansion. This money is all tied up until you have enough sense to use it. I believe Almighty God saying that to the church today. We've toiled, uh, and we've trifled with gifts of the Spirit. We're far more with the gifts of the Spirit of the, than the Holy Spirit himself. And God has treasures beyond our comprehension. <coughs> he says he can bring out of his treasury things new and old. So he's moved the people. They say, what shall we do? The publicans cry out. They're a bunch, aren't they? Stony-hearted rascals. And yet with the conviction of the Spirit, they cry out, what shall we do? And John gives the answer in verse 16. He said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one cometh after me, I'm not even worthy to carry his shoes. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, or with Holy Ghost fire. We talk about the baptism of the Spirit. It's really the baptism of Jesus. There's nothing you can get this side of eternity that didn't come through Jesus Christ. My dear old principal used to call the gift of the, the coming of the Holy Ghost upon us the coronation gift of Jesus. 
Jesus says, there's somebody waiting to come down, but he won't come down till I've gone up. When I ascend, he will descend. I have been with you, he shall be in you. When Jesus was on earth, he was tied up. If he was in Galilee, he couldn't be down there in Bethlehem. If he was in Bethlehem, he couldn't be somewhere else. But he says, when I go and the Spirit comes, he will be in you and he'll be with you and abide with you forever while you walk in the light he gives you. His hand is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor. But he will burn the chaff with fire. Burn up the fire. Uh, burn up, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And many other things in, in his exhortation. Did he, I wonder what they were. I wish he'd left a list of them, don't you? Here is a man with no financial backing. He has no program. He has the favor of nobody. He has the Roman army against him. He has the religious army of the Jews against him. He has the Pharisees against him. He has the Sadducees against him. He has no money. He doesn't need it. And he doesn't have a miracle ministry. It says very clearly, John did no miracle. Nobody ran after him, have mercy on my son, he's a lunatic. Nobody cried, unclean, 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 or open my eyes, or I'm deaf or something. Nobody said that. He didn't raise the dead. I don't have to express it. I wish I had a vocabulary I'd express it. He never unstopped their face. He never opened blind eyes. He never cured a withered leg or a withered arm. He didn't raise a dead man. He raised a dead nation. Single-handedly. God has had this man in the school of silence. He's been talking to God and walking with God and weeping before God. He's lived with Jeremiah. He's lived with the prophets. Well, why does he get on? You say he has no role model. Because he knew what Isaiah said, that one day a man should come in the wilderness crying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. <coughs> Make straight in the desert a, a highway for our God. Isaiah 35 says that highway should be called the way of holiness. And that a wayfaring man, no fool, need other therein. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. God always works in the minority. You've got a wonderful list in 1 Corinthians 15 of, of people that saw Jesus in his resurrection power. And then it ties the knot on the end of the cotton and it says he was seen of 500 brethren at once. And I'm convinced in my spirit it was those 500. It says, tarry till you be endued with power. How many went? 120, 380 of them never bothered. It's always like that. God uses a minority. There's only a few people who want to go outside the camp. There's only a few people who want to die with him. Again, I remind you, when Jesus went outside of the camp, it was a place where just the only freedom that lepers had was to walk outside the camp. It was a place where all the sewage of the city went. It was a place where they threw dead bodies and dead animals. It was a stink hole. And the holiest man that ever lived went outside the camp that you might go inside of it. And yet you have to whip some people to church almost. I don't wonder. If I went to the church they go to, I'd want whipping too. Isn't it tragic, isn't it almost blasphemy to go to a meeting and you say, oh, that meeting was cold? The meeting was so dead. How can you have the living Christ in a dead meeting? Or put it the other way, how can a dead meeting if the living Christ is there? How, you go, how can you go out? After all, our business is to talk about eternity. It's to talk about a time when there's no bonds and no other stuff materialistic. It's all vanished. We're going to a kingdom that knows nothing of these material things. We're so slack and so careless about these things. I like flags. I must confess that. I like flags. I'd like to get a flag of the Salvation Army if they still have them. It had a cross on, it had blood and fire on. William Booth was half Jew and half Gentile. He just about got kicked out of the Methodist church in Leicester, I think it was in England. Walked out of the church. They wanted to appoint him to a certain church. They read from the register. The clerk said, William Booth is appointed to so-and-so to be pastor. And his wife got up and shouted above the top of the crowd, he's not going. Poor William. He wasn't William the Conqueror then, was he? 
William, you can't go. That's not for you. And he walked outside and put his arm around her shoulder. She had a curvature of the spine. And he, she said, he said, darling, we're going to raise up an army. From where? We'll take all the cast-offs or dropouts from the churches. We go to the gutter. And he wrote a wonderful hymn, Thou Christ of burning, cleansing flame, send the fire. We ought to learn that. Thy blood-bought gift today we claim, send the fire. Look down and see this waiting host. Give us the promised Holy Ghost. We want another Pentecost. I'm not sure we do, but we need it. To make our weak hearts strong and brave, send the fire. To live a dying world to save, send the fire. O oh, see us on thine altar, lay our lives, our all this very day, to crown the offering, now we pray, send the fire. Again, wake our weak hearts, strong and brave. The only way you can get dross out of gold is to put it in a crucible. Today they put it in an induction crucible. You press the buttons, the heat comes up, the gold slab. The gold goes to the bottom, it's heavier than lead, it's heavier than iron. And it sinks to the bottom of the crucible, and a man sits there, with a sieve and he takes the scum off the top and throws it out and throws it out and he's there half an hour then he quits are you tired? no why do you quit? it's pure how do you know? because I can see my reflection in it doesn't Malachi say when he comes he's a purifier of silver who shall abide the day of his coming? Dear God, we talk about one new revival. If we have a Holy Ghost revival, maybe you won't sleep for the first ten days of it. God will do such a refining, such a purifying. Maybe not on your husband or your wife, on you. Fifty years ago, the most popular chorus was, Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me, all his wonderful passion and purity. O thou spirit divine, all my nature refine until the beauty of Jesus, the refiner sits there, he has me in the furnace and he heats it and he heats it and he heats it. And it feels like hell sometimes. And he throws out what he doesn't like. My pride, my ambition, my secret lust, my temper, my unforgiving spirit, my stubbornness. We don't think much of that. Stubbornness is a sin of witchcraft in the word of God. And he purifies until he looks in me and sees his reflection. He won't be satisfied. He doesn't come to see it make me a great preacher or a great writer or a great singer or a great organizer. He comes because he wants to reflect his beauty in my life. Gentleness and meekness and holiness. The self-life goes out. Self-interest goes out. Self-glory goes out. Self-seeking goes out. Self-righteousness goes out. Do you think it's easy? We've lived with it so long that we like ourselves. And God long ago stopped liking us. And the Word of God talks about the Word of God being a mirror. You know, and when revival comes, he holds the mirror up and you see yourself. Remember the old story of Cromwell? An artist begged could he paint him. And Cromwell had a great big wart on his chin. And the artist painted it minus the wart. When he went in, he said, what do you think? He said, paint me wart and all. It's part of me. Lord, paint me, but don't show me my what. Don't show me I'm basically selfish. I'm full of self-interest. I'm full of self-seeking. I'm full of pride. I'm full of anger. I'm full of bitterness. I have an unforgiveness. Don't show me it. I'm, I'm as ugly as the devil. The smart boys today, if you listen to Shula tomorrow, poor lost soul that he is, he'll tell you, your trouble is, your, your self-image is so poor. You're such a pure image of yourself. No, your trouble is you're too good an image of yourself. Paint me wart and all. Okay, as usual, I run out of time. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. William Booth put up his slogan, blood and fire. In the news this morning, they said we're going to show the automobiles for the last hundred years. About 19, let me see, 30... Uh, Four, thirty-five, thirty-four, thirty-five. Studi Baker made a wonderful automobile. It had a torpedo nose. It was a marvelous looking thing. I remember there was one on, on show in our city. Crowds went, look at this Yankee thing. Look at this Yankee automobile. Does it fly? No, no, it keeps on the ground. It's got a nose, a bullet nose. Studi Baker stood in uh, Newcastle, Pennsylvania one day, the late 1890s. 
He was saying goodbye to a young man who was the most brilliant orator in the University of America. His name was Brengel. Stuni Baker shook hands with him and he said, Brengel, I wish I were sure of becoming the President of the United States as I am that you'll become the Prime Minister, uh, that you'll become the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. Stuni Baker and this fellow had been buddies in a college. Stuni Baker, poor soul, all he did was become a millionaire. This young man with his oratory went and laid at the feet of Jesus. He got to London tired out. Remember, he went on a boat. It took four weeks to get there. You do it in three and a half hours now. William Booth said, bring the young man in, in the morning to see me, the young man from America. <coughs> well, who are you? He said, I'm Dr. Brengel. Dr. Brengel? They didn't need doctors. The theology wasn't sick. What have you come for? I heard the Holy Ghost is here. I've crossed the Atlantic. I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't depend on my theology, my learning. I have a lot of scholarship. But I need fire, I need fire, I need fire. William Booth said, you get it tomorrow morning at five o'clock. You, you polish the shoes of 50 students. And none of them had one leg. A hundred big high top boots. Not spray polish. We used to have polish when we were kids in England. It was black clay. And you took it to the tap and ran water on it and then took the brush. <laughs> when mother wasn't looking, you spit on it. And you made the clay and put it on the boots. Oh, my dad's big, big boots. They took hours to dry. And enough strength to polish them. But he said it was there God taught me a lesson of patience. They didn't open the door and say, we're waiting for a talented man like you to teach on the book of the Revelation. We'd like you to lead the prayer meeting tomorrow. They said, stick your nose down there. Brengel did. And he waited on God, and God filled him with the Holy Ghost. They established an office, office, office in the Salvation Army that they'd never given to anybody in its history. They called him the Spiritual Special. He preached in Sweden to a crowded house of about 1,500 people and people came to the altar and somebody went to this woman and she did this. So they found somebody who could speak the sign language. And the lady said, would you ask her why she came to this altar? Did she hear a word? No, 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 no. No, no. But why did you come to... The I was... In the gallery, yes, yes, yes. Why did you come to the altar? Because I could see what I'd never seen in a preacher in my life. What? What was it? I saw the beauty of Jesus in him while he was preaching. I don't know what he was saying, but I knew there was something in him I didn't have. Come on, parent. Are you living so your children will want something that's in your life that's beautiful? That they can't see in school and they can't see in a magazine and they can't see in church, maybe? My mother was a role model for me. My daddy was a role model. The best thing he ever did, he took me to a prayer meeting when I was 14 years of age. And I remember that night, it comes back to me often, often, often. See, we've got the idea that the only reason you have to be filled with the Holy Ghost is you're going to be a missionary. The greatest breakdown in America is not in brothels tonight. And it's not in abortion. The greatest breakdown in America is in the home. The daddies are no longer the king and the priest. And if you're not, you're a failure. I don't get how many millions you have in the bank. Right. Somebody loaned me a tape of this message I preached years ago. I wish I could preach like that. I have the energy now. But I was preaching in the head church of the Nazarene in, in Perth, gorgeous city of Perth in Scotland. And the pastor said, Len, on Saturday, I want you to come with me to Dundee. Oh, I know Dundee. It's famous for Dundee cakes, fruit cakes, famous all over the world. It's famous for its architecture. It's famous for its whiskey. I'm going to preach at the Cherryfield Mission. I said, good. We came out of the train station, which was just at the back of the church. And there was a huge sign across, Dr. James Baxter McClagan will be preaching here, the anniversary service, 3 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. And he's only a little guy. I said, I said, you know, the poster's bigger than you are. I can't wait to hear you preach. I'm not preaching this afternoon. Who is? He said, you. I said, forget it. 
He had a wonderful voice. He played a concertina. He got them all singing. And he said, we're going to sing one more song. And then my dear friend Leonard Raven is going to preach. I thought, oh, I didn't think Christians were as mean as that. Well, I preached about the Holy Ghost. And at the end I said, how many of you today want to really be filled? You want God to burn up everything in you which is unlike him. Burn it, burn it, burn it. Not repair it, not clean it up. Burn it, destroy it, root and branch. I'm going to sing it in a minute. Breathe on me, breath of God. Twelve people raised their hands. I said, I have five minutes to get off this platform, round the corner for a train. We've got to get back to the city. But 13 isn't unlucky. Any, any 30? And the lady went like this, like that. And I said, fine, I saw it. Aww. And she smiled. So that was it. We got the train and shivered all the way back. The River Tay was frozen with ice blocks bigger than this table. I guess eight, ten years after, dear Martha and I were in a meeting in uh, Manchester. An afternoon meeting. And boy, it was stuffy. No ventilation. People were saying, you know, the spirit isn't here, the devil's here. Forget it, it's not the devil, it's a janitor. <laughs> he overheated the place. And no ventilation, what do you expect? The preacher couldn't get through, he sat down. A little lady at the end of the platform was there swinging her legs like this, and I thought she, she's wishing she could reach him and kick him and get him moving. <laughs> the president of the class knew a uh, meeting knew it hadn't gone very well. He says, now we do have ten minutes before we have tea and cookies. <clears throat> I'm going to ask so-and-so to give a testimony. Boy, she jumped up like a kangaroo. One, two, she got up and said, I want to tell you something happened one day in the Cherryfield Mission away in Scotland. I went to a meeting one afternoon to hear J.B. McClaggett didn't preach. Lennon Draven. Well, I was at the back and I ducked down anyhow. I ducked down more and more, you know. <laughs> I thought, what's coming? I was a Christian, nervous, timid, afraid. The most timid girl in the whole of Scotland. I couldn't even look at a man. I blushed. She got rid of that before too long, of course. And I was, I was terrified. I never worked this out. Here's a woman weighing 125 pounds. Here's a thing that weighs less than half an ounce. And she jumps off the chair in case it touches her over his head or something. <laughs> what are you nervous about? She said, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And that day I wrote a letter to Birkenhead, to the holiness people there, and asked them, I want to come to your school. I want to be a missionary. God wants me to be a missionary. I was in the top ten of students. Before that, I had no education. I just swept up the debris in a factory. And every time I went to a meeting and said, Oh, God, I wish I'd gone forward and let you really do something, the devil said, It's only for scholars. It's only for preachers. You're no good. You're backward. You're retarded. Well, not retarded. You're dumb. And I listened to the devil. But that afternoon, Brother Edna said this, if you'll come here, he quoted a hymn, I will praise him, I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sin the When God's fire upon the altar of my heart was set ablaze, my ambitions, plans and wishes at my feet in ashes lay. And he said, let God take the ashes, he'll do my life to the ashes, and you can do with a whole life or a hundred lives. And I trusted him to fill me with the Holy Ghost. They accepted me, I was hoping they wouldn't, but they accepted me at the Bible school. I was in the top ten of students. They have a school in Paris, France. They have a school for prospective missionaries to learn whatever language you want to learn. I went to the school there, and I came out in the top ten of the students there. After God quickened my mind, present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is just reasonable service, and your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. And she said, I it touched my mind. And she smiled a big smile, and she said, and I went to Africa, I'd just come back. I went right in the heart of the forest, where the men are somewhere up there. Big, big men. At night, somebody knocks on my door. Missy, 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 please come. Wife, very sick, wife, very sick. He has a lamb. And she said, we go to the river, and there's a log. No bridge, just a greasy log. And he's balancing with the lamp. He takes my lamp, and he's like this, and I'm looking at his feet, going over a log, and there's a friend down there. He's only got one cavity. <laughs> and he's ready to fill it. <laughs> if I slip, I'm right in the mouth of that oct uh, octopus, I was going to say. <laughs> now, what do you call it now? 
No, it wasn't alligator. No, it wasn't a co Come on, you're as ignorant as me. It was a hippo. Hippopotamus. He said, I go and deliver a baby. And the man says, I come back with you. No, stay with your wife. She needs you for the next hour or two. I take my lamp and I come to the river and there are friends waiting. On the way I hear the roar of a lion. I look and I see one of those monstrous boa constrictors wriggling around a branch ready to grab me. And she said, I walk across that little narrow, 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 looks narrow and narrow all the time, log. And there I'm singing blessed assurance. And I sure need it. I get home and I haven't been in my little bed. It's made of leaves, she said, and a cloth. And I hear something scratching at the door. It's a friendly lion that's around the neighborhood. I just say to him, uh, sir, you can go away. I'm not on the menu tonight. Just laugh at the whole thing. Timid, frightened of a mouse, not, not afraid of lions. I walk through the forest by myself. God hasn't given me the spirit of fear. He's given me the spirit of love and of power and of sound mind. I don't fear men. I don't fear the future. I don't fear the devil. Has God got any fear in him? How in God's name can you say you're filled with God if you're nervous and frightened about something? There's no fear in God. That precious little woman went on to write pages of history. It's not what you have that you can bring to God. It's what God can give you. We don't have men like we used to have. I say some of you fellows need to get down to business. You need to read Acts 2 and Acts 3. Read Acts 26. Get the two big volumes written by a little Baptist guy, Arnold Dallimore, I talked with him. Two big volumes on the life of George Whitfield, maybe the greatest preacher of America, England or America ever had. When he came to England, the population of Boston was 12,000 and he drew 14,000 a night without blacktops, without restaurants. One man says, I put my wife on the back of the old mare and I got up, but the snow was so deep we struggled up hills and valleys and finally I got off and just led the horse and I was soaking wet. There were no pews, no shelter. I stood there in the snow and heard the man who was blazing with God. I never thought about creature comforts. I never realized till I moved that my trousers were almost stiff with frost. They were wet through and then they were stiffing in the frost. We went home. The poor old mare was tired out next day when we got home. But we turned round and came back again. Why did they go all that way? Preachers don't have to do that now. You just get enough money and you get a, a TV program and poor swell headed guys think they're turning the world upside down. And we're as far lost down the pit as we were before they started. God isn't looking for organizing, he's looking for agonizing. And he talks about praying in the Holy Ghost, and I want to learn more of that. It's beyond praying in tongues, and I'm not knocking tongues. Well, let me go back here a minute. What does it say? John Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost. The first day he was born, did he speak in tongues? didn't speak anything. I'm not knocking tongues. I'm saying people are making a fetish of them. They think they're superior. When I was young, you were scorned if you spoke in tongues. Now you're scorned if you don't. God is looking for many he can totally possess. It's painful. It's fire. I'll say this in a sentence. I was trapped in a fire in 1951 in Chicago, three stories up in a burning, a burning, burning building. Some people were burned to death. I suffer, I'm suffering now. I'm in pain now. I've been in pain all my life since, since 51. I've had healings in other areas, but some areas have no healing. It's a thorn in the flesh as far as I'm concerned. It can stay there as long as God wants it doesn't trouble me. God isn't any less to me. Maybe I need something to keep me down. But let me say this now as I finish. What we've had in the last 25 years with all the Pentecostal churches we have and everything else, we haven't moved this nation to God. 
Jimmy Spraggett, we preached at this school a while ago. Nearly 2,000 students, but nobody knows they're in town. Assembly of God headquarters at where? Springfield, nobody knows they're in town. Orals always saying we 4,000 students. People, well, how is it 120 turned the world upside down? They had no money. They had the screen. They couldn't throw what they were saying into a million homes. I'm sure in my own heart, disagree if you like, you're right to do that. What God is looking for is to take total possession of some men, their spirit, their soul, their body, their mind, their wills. I went to a little college, Cliff College. It only had one revival. I wasn't there. A friend of mine who was up in years in the 1930s, two or three, he'd been in World War I. He was a drunkard, a blasphemer, and everything else. A very precious, gorgeous lady led him to Christ, and he fell in love with her. And they fixed a day for the wedding. They went to an old holiness meeting, and they were singing, I think it was a hymn, the same hymn, I will praise him. No, it was another one. But when it came to the stanza, here I give my all to thee, friends and time and earthly store, soul and body thine to be only thine forevermore. And he sang it, here I give my friends to... She's the only friend I have in the world. We're going to be married in three months. I have a house stored with new furniture. And the Lord said, you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Cost you everything. Postpone your wedding for three years. Give him all your time. Your earthly store is all the furniture you have for the future. Sell it and buy your paper to go to Cliff College. He went to Cliff College. There were about 35 students there, as they were when I was there, 35 men. He woke up one morning about 2 o'clock with a craving for God. Dan Phillips was his name. We had one, two, three lecture halls. Number three lecture hall was the most popular one. He came down in his pyjamas into the third lecture hall at 1 o'clock in the morning, between 1 and 2, and started crying to God. And he just roared. Lord, I'm a preacher. Lord, I win souls, but my heart is not full of holiness. It's not full of love. It's not full of the power of the Spirit. It's not full of humility. It's not full of gentleness. It's not even full of peace. Send the fire down to this heart of mine. And he cried for about half an hour, and every man in the college left his bed, and they were all there in that room, in their pajamas, crying to God. And the Spirit of the living God came on them. And the Holy Ghost swept, swept through the college for weeks. He didn't think when he yielded his life, and I was going to say his wife, she wasn't his wife yet, and all he had in Manchester, the result would be that a whole college where well, we had some of the most brilliant preachers, Samuel Chadwick was there, Joe Bryce was there, some of the outstanding preachers of England were there, but it wasn't through their preaching, it's when a man obeyed God and tossed the bedclothes on one side and came down in a room that was cold and said, God, I need just the fire of the Holy Ghost, not for tonight, but for all my life. I want to refuel my life continually with the Spirit. It's not enough to be filled with the Holy Spirit ten years ago. I don't care whether you were baptized. The question isn't where you feel ten years. Are you filled tonight? Are you filled with God tonight? Are you filled with love tonight? Are you filled with power tonight? Are you filled with passion for the lost? Come on, in God's name, God's going to bypass. If God doesn't do something in time, I'm going to move. But I don't want to. God wants me here. Nobody will know till eternity the precious browns. What that lovely home of theirs meant. We met there first. Martha and I and Dale and Betty one afternoon. We had some cookies and tea. I think Betty said, would you pray before? And I, I prayed and I said, God, make this house a house of prayer for all nations, which he did. Yeah. Men in Africa say, write to me. Big George, you remember? Big black man. I can't forget those meetings in the Browns. One night in a meeting where the Holy Ghost comes, you'll never forget it. You can't erase it. They, we have been praying for eight years for this community. Is God going to forsake us? One day the pillar of fire is going to come and you know what? We won't need to advertise. There'll be such a meekness, such a sweetness, such a holiness, such a gentleness, such a loving kindness. The fruits of the Spirit, they never scream. You may scream if you're gifts, you don't scream for the fruits. It's not easy. 
God will wreck your career, He'll wreck your lifestyle. You think that little girl, young lady, lay on about this size in that meeting that afternoon in Cherryfield Mission in Dundee had a dream she'd go to Africa and write a new chapter? She'd never get fear. God would take away her fear and give her boldness. God would give her to pray revival into that area of Africa without anybody with her. John Baptist had no prayer partner even. No financial backing. I've had a man being after me for two years. We want to set up a... Uh, a tax-free foundation for you. You know, I have an idea if I do that, God will quit providing my needs. I'd rather somebody give me a dollar out of love than give me a thousand dollars for tax exemption. Maybe you don't like that, that's all right, I do. You're going to sing Mr. Hatch's hymn. A brilliant English preacher, he had a packed church, he had stacks of money, he was a favourite preacher in town. But one night he said, I went into my office and said, Lord, I'm not satisfied with popularity, I'm not satisfied with the favour of men, I'm not satisfied with my eloquence. Breathe on me, breath of God. And he snatched a piece of paper and he wrote this hymn we're going to sing now. <coughs> It's 167. Maybe you want to meet God in some new way. If you do, why don't you kneel at your chair while we're singing? Let others sing it. Or if you want to, kneel somewhere. And say, Lord, I want something tonight I've never had in my life. I want the destruction of my self-life, my self-interest, my temper, my pride, my fear of man, my fear of the future, my fear of what the relatives will think of me. Destroy it. All hell is looking into this meeting at this moment. All angels are looking in. And Jesus is waiting to save the travail of his soul. What was it? 174. Would you stand and sing? Or if you want to kneel, kneel. Sit, re, put your hymn book on your chair and sing it. Sorry, 167.